Good morning. My name is Holly Herrera, and I am the board administrator for today's work session, May 2nd, 2024. This is a reminder that this meeting is being recorded. Chair Stevens, we are ready to begin. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and uh, this is a work session uh, for the board with the agency staff. Attendees from the public are welcome to observe. The chat function as well as the attendee cameras and microphones will be turned off. And if you would like to submit public comment, please do that through the ODAV website for the June 6, 2024 board meeting. So with that, we'll call this meeting to order and uh, give it back to you, Holly, for a roll call. Thank you, Chair Stevens. Uh, Sarah Lucas. Present. Bill Grop. Present. And then uh, position three, so that's currently in the process of being filled. Um, Catherine Stevens. Present. And Jeff Preacher, he did give me a call at 840 today, letting me know that he's at a currently at a fire chief conference. Uh, so he may be able to pop in when he can. Uh, just wanted to let you know, uh, Chair Stevens, uh, to excuse him for the record. OK, thank you. We'll do so. And then uh, Steve Nagy. Looks like Jeff is in. I see him. I'll just say, let me make him uh, give him speaking privileges here on camera. Morning, Jeff. Good morning. And OK, so Jeff Pritchard is now in uh, Jim Knight. I'm here. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, and it looks like um, so it, it does look like um, Steve Nagy is not in yet, but I'll let you know when he does arrive. Uh, roll okay. call is complete, and we are at quorum. Thank you. All right, thank you, Holly, and we will toss it right over to Kenji Sukar for the director update. That was quick. So uh, <laughs> just to start out, uh, I have an interesting background if uh, if you look behind me. Uh, the reason I popped this up and not the, the usual background was, A, I, could, I, I thought I had my background on my computer, but I didn't. But th this is actually a picture that I took back in back in March, and it was the winner, even though it's we're not part of ODOT, it was the ODOT picture of the month. So they selected it out of a bunch of pictures and they put it up on their internal website and it was, it was pretty cool. And now they're using it for a lot, all sorts of stuff. And it also was on the uh, the governor's uh, social media as well. So that popped up there. So we're well, uh, pretty proud of that picture. So I did that. So I will now start my presentation. So stand by. Hold on, let me do this. Share. Okay, window, 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 window. There we go. And then let's see. Does it does it pop up as as okay. the does does it show the full presentation or is it showing uh, the uh, the the speaker's version? It's the full. Okay, perfect. All right. So we just had AVSI Exponential, which is a huge drone conference uh, and also includes advanced air mobility in San Diego. And uh, Alex, Andrea and myself went down uh, and it, we had a big booth there. If you could take a look, it was it was fantastic. Uh, we, we went in with Business Oregon. So we had it was a nice collaboration. And we had we actually met with a bunch of companies down there as well. So we met with UPS Flight 4, Talus, USDOT, uh, Office of Secretary of Transportation, and uh, even Bill Grout made it down. So Bill had a uh, I'll, I'll ask him in a second to give his uh, his sort of input into what, what he saw and what, what he thought. So thought that was really interesting. And what was really nice was there was a great presence by Oregon companies as well. So in our booth, at least, we had the Pen Pendleton and Tilmuk test ranges, uh, the Oregon UAS Accelerator, the Cayuse Native Solutions Company, Delmar Training, and then associated with it, there was uh, Sage Tech as well. They were a little bit separate, but Power for Flight, Range Air, and Attainment Innovations was also in, in that booth. Uh, there were thousands of people showing up. We made the rounds. Uh, we spoke with a lot of companies. And there was a lot of states uh, that had booths as well. So, for example, Virginia, Michigan, 
Oklahoma had had a lot of a big big booth as well. So we were in good company. It was good to be there and to interact with all the the stakeholders in the industry was was fantastic as well. Uh, so I will go to the next page. One of the things that I was able to do, uh, but before that, before I go any further, Bill, did you have any input or any takeaways? Uh, just a short that uh, I was pretty uh, taken back by just how many billions of dollars is in the uncrewed aviation industry. And I should have remembered that underwater is still part of that whole situation with AUVSI. And uh, just the amount of technology and development that goes on uh, was pretty pretty eye opening for me, and I'm really happy to be there. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> so as you can see, there was a lot of vendors and a lot of activity, a lot of people, a lot of great sessions as well. And uh, I'm glad, Bill, that you came along. Uh, you were definitely a benefit to have, and just have you experience what the industry is actually like. So thanks for thanks for making time to come out. Um, but one of the other things that I was able to do at the the exponential is I got to make a presentation on uh, the multi-state collaborative. And just to give you an, an idea of what the multi-state collaborative is, it's a loose federation of 27 states. So there are 27 states in it. And what we are doing is creating a set of consensus papers that really creates the framework of how AAM would be deployed in the states. And I've listed out sort of some of the key pieces of it. So we're working toward harmonizing state efforts so that industry can expect consistent consistency across states. And the reason why is operations aren't just going to happen within one state. So they're, they're going to cross borders. So to make sure that the policies are there, they're consistent. Um, so industry knows what to expect because setting expectations that are consistent creates an environment where industry can actually thrive. So that's a good thing. Uh, and also working with the FAA as well, because uh, the FAA controls the airspace, right? But at the same time, they need to work hand in hand with the states, uh, especially on the land use planning side, side as well. And then exploring common infrastructure as well. So you think, think about it, what services are needed on the ground, whether they be data services, what infra, hard infrastructure is needed, uh, just so there's a little bit of consistency. Uh, there's no recommendation in terms of what exact uh, solution set is gonna, going to be required because it's going to be up to each state to, to go through their procurement process to figure out what exactly will be purchased uh, by the states or uh, what will be required. So as, as, as it says, avoid solution exercise and just focusing on general capabilities. And one of the key components of the multi-state collaborative is making sure that there's consistency among all the organizations that are involved in the process, whether that be uh, the uh, AAAC, which is the Advanced Aviation Advisor Committee that I'm part of, uh, the Advanced Air Mobility Interagency Work Group, which is on the federal side, uh, the FAA Office of Airports. Uh, we're also looking to reach out to AAAE um, as well as other organizations that are tackling this, uh, just because we don't want uh, all these efforts going in different directions. We want that consistency. So it, it's, a, it's a really big messaging point as well. And one of the primary components that I want to make sure that that's emphasized in that uh, a lot of aviation folks haven't been concentrating on is the land use aspect of it because all land use is, is at a local level and making sure that our land use planners understand what's coming down the pike, what to expect. Uh, so if something falls in their lap, they're not caught by surprise, right? Because nobody likes surprises. Uh, one thing that's really interesting as well is that the next meeting for the multi-state collaborative will be in the gorge uh, July 15th through 16th. And that's going to be jointly put on by ODAV as well as um, the WashDOT as well. So that's, well, that's the plan at least. And we're hoping to show off the gorge as, as a great place to not only recreate and live, but also to have businesses. So that's going on. And then uh, uh, all the rest, right? What, what else is going on? Uh, strategic plan, uh, I know that's been long coming. We actually received three responses to the RFP, and we are at, we are in the process of choosing. So you'll you'll get an update next board meeting, next steps, and we'll be moving forward with that. 
Uh, and then on the education workforce development side, uh, we have a meeting planned at the Hillsborough Air Show where we'll be having a number of educators together, OAS, CTEC, uh, LCC, and then really just starting to plan for some big efforts in 2025. We're looking at a sort of a big, not really a trade show, but a gathering of educators just to get everybody talking uh, and start sharing ideas and almost a symposium educational piece um, to really gain some consistency and also align everybody's interests on the uh, education side as well. Uh, Oak Ridge, we'll, real quick, uh, we signed a MOU with Lane Community College. They're going to be running some operations out of there. And one of the key things that we worked with uh, LCC is making sure that they conduct community outreach. So we're looking at May 10th for some uh, a, a get to know you day. And the, the media is also invited. There's going to be some drone folks. There's going to be um, LCC students will be flying. So there's been there's been coordination with ODAV as well. We'll be there just to make sure things are running smoothly. And it's a great opportunity for uh, the community to really understand what the technology is all about and uh, really address some of their questions that they might have. Because with, with, with drones, there's there's a negative connotation. Some people are afraid, and it's it's not wrong uh, to, to, to feel that way, but to, just to really give an opportunity to address their concerns and educate and talk about the technology and show in what positive ways that it can be used. So that's going to be going on. Um, yeah. That's my update for for uh, this work session. Any questions? Kenji, is the LCC um, agreement, is that just for drone, with their drone program, or is that for fixed wing also? Uh, that's their large, that's their sort of medium large uh, platform, but the MOU is they can use our airport. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. the, the the team over there is great so it's it's fantastic working with them they've been re very receptive to our suggestions and in, in working together on this project right any questions for kenji on the director's report yeah kenji this is um, bill I this, oh go ahead go ahead I, I didn't mean to interrupt, Bill. Uh, I just wanted to say for the record that uh Steve maybe Steve Nagy has arrived uh, okay oh wait so great. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, go um, ahead, Bill. Uh, Kenji, I was wondering if the meeting in the gorge on the AAM State Multi-State Collaborative is open for people to come and listen. Uh should be. Yeah, to listen. Yeah, I, I'd see so. So you, you can. Well, part of the meeting will be closed, so it won't be open to the public. Uh, but I'll, I'll talk with the team and figure out uh, what what may be available. Board members, I, I don't see why not, but the, the general public, I'm, not, I'm unsure whether that they're, they'd be invited to that, but uh, I will definitely check into that. Uh, and uh, Jeff just reminded me as well, you know, I, I should have mentioned he was there too, but he's at every single conference that I am, so I occasionally <laughs> forget, forget he's there. So Jeff, my apologies. Uh, if you're still on the phone, uh, would love to hear your input real quickly as well. Jeff, you there? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the conference was overwhelming as usual. There's so much activity, um, so many different collaboratives and work projects um, that are happening in the background. It's always exciting to see how, uh, you know, how the industry is, is evolving. Um, on, on a UAS side, one of the things that did happen while we were there is uh, we had two Oregon agencies that do UAS uh, participate in a webinar uh, for Drone Safety Day, which was uh, the 27th of, um, of April. Uh, and we partnered with NASA on, uh, on highlighting the importance of the aviation safety reporting system uh, for UAS. Most of the, the general aviation pilots are aware of, of ACERS and what it does, uh, but in 2021, they released uh, a, a new segment of it for uncrewed aviators. And uh, 
we had two Oregon agencies, uh, Eugene Police Department and the Scappoose Fire District were able to, to participate in that effort. So it was, uh, it was awesome to be uh, part of that and uh, to see everything that's happening. Thanks, Kenji. You know, you know, if you don't know, Jeff is like a celebrity in the uh, the the drone industry, especially on the public safety side. <laughs> he he's always he's always in demand. He's always asked to to, to speak at uh, at a lot of events. So he's among uh, one of the the star studded board that we have. So Jeff, thank you for so much for your input. And I, I, I always love seeing what you do because every time I talk to you, you're doing something really interesting. So uh, you rock. Thank you so much. Uh, and on that note, Catherine, anything else? Uh, if there are any other questions for Kenji? You know, Kenji, I was just thinking, um, I, and it's interesting that you know, Eugene Police were, was also involved in that. Um, I know that they just uh, had a couple of pretty high profile incidents where they put up a drone and it assisted them. It might be interesting to have a presentation for the board at some point just on some of the applications that are drones are being used for in our own community um, just at a future sure. board meeting. Yeah, that'd be great. I think that'd be Maybe awesome. Maybe have some guest speakers come in and talk a little oh, yeah. bit about what they're doing with them. Oh yeah, and then what? What? Uh, there's a large national group called the Law Enforcement Drone Association, and Jeff is actually a, a board member for them. Uh, it got its start in Oregon, of all places, and huh. the the annual uh, the annual meeting was actually in Bend for uh, quite a number of years, and I think this is the first year they're going to have a bi bi coastal. Uh, sort of annual meeting as well. So there's going to be one on the east coast and one on the west coast. It's 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 grown so big because so many public safety uh, entities are interested in it because they do a knockout job that they had to split. But uh, I, I was actually a presenter at one of their first meetings, which is fantastic, which is kind of funny. But uh, we have that. That's a local uh, sort of asset that we have. So if people have questions, they're a subject matter expert, and especially other law enforcement agencies or firefighting agencies or other public agencies um, throughout the Oregon, if they have questions on how to set up programs or they have questions about technology, uh, the Law Enforcement Drone Association is, is a great resource for that. Uh, so they, 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 they give hands-on experiences with the technology as well, which is highly unusual, which is, which, which is a great way to approach it so people can understand what this does. So I will definitely work to make sure that we can get a, uh, a demo and maybe we'll do that at one of our uh, board meetings and then have that as part of our uh, sort of our extracurricular activity, have, have a drone demo. Uh, Jeff, if you want to fly FPV, that would, be, that would be awesome. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Right. Very good. Any other questions for Kenji? No. OK, if not, then we will move on to the finance manager overview with Kristen. Good morning. OK, so I am going to share my screen here. OK, can you see my screen now? Yep. Yes. Yes. OK, great. OK, so I am going to give you an overview of the finance and administration department. So here is our department. So we have four employees. So I'm the finance manager and then we have the fiscal assistant, the registration specialist and the administrative specialist. And here is our team. So I want to give you an overview of what we all do together, and then I'm going to break down what each of these ladies does as well. So on the left is Lisa, and she's our accountant. In the middle is Jerry, and she's the registration and administrative specialist. And then on the right is Holly, who you all know, our aviation board administrator and our administrative specialist. So what our department does, so we do all of the finances for the agency. So we do the accounts receivable and accounts payable, the asset tracking, the aircraft and public UAS registration, also the airport licensing. We do accounts receivable reporting, revenue expense cash balance tracking, and budget development. And then we manage the finances for the federal grants. And then we submit those requests for reimbursements for the FAA and for our Connect Oregon grants. 
And then we also do the administration for the agency. So we're the front office reception. We are the group that's ordering your office supplies, um, getting your computer ready for you, phones, um, taking care of the mail for the agency. And then also the aviation board administration, website updates, taking care of the social media, um, administrating the agency credit cards. That's the state credit card that we use. Um, we're also helping with rulemaking and new employee orientation. And then we're the liaison for central services. So ODOT does a lot of our central services. Um, and so often case we're the ones coordinating the in-between, like for example, H they do our HR for us, but we're the ones um, getting all that paperwork ready for the employees and then having them fill it out and then sending it to HR, that kind of thing. And then we also do a lot of the reporting for the agency. So one of the challenges of a small agency is we have a lot of the same reporting requirements as the larger agencies do. And so that's one of the challenges with our division is, you know, we have a lot to do. So we're all, you know, trying to get done our job and a lot of the reports for the agency as well. Um, so we take care of the affirmative action plan, the diversity, equity, inclusion plan. We do the annual performance progress reports. So those are the um, key KPM reports. We do the agency annual report, uh, the fiscal and reporting. So that's for the state and for the federal reports. And then we do the financial reports for the agency, the quarterly asset reporting. We manage um, the records retention for the agency. So there's requirements of how long we need to keep documents. So we're the ones um, tracking those and um, getting rid of, rid of those when we need to. And then we are also managing the public record requests for the agency. So there's a lot of um, requirements for those as far as like the timelines that we have to meet when we do get a public records request. So we're making sure that our agency is meeting those requirements and coordinating with DOJ when we need to on those. And now I'm going to go into a little more detail about what each of the employees does. So this is Jerry, um, and she's the registration specialist for the agency. So she's the front office reception. So she's going to be greeting you when you come in the office and answering the phone for all those general questions that come in. And so she's the one registering all the aircraft and the public body UAS. And then she's doing those public airport licenses. And then a big part of her job is collections. Um, and that's mostly for the um, aircraft registration. So, you know, she's sending out those invoices and then she's following up when she doesn't get the payments and sending out the letters or making the phone calls or sending those emails um, to try to collect as much as um, she can for the agency. Um, and she also does a really good job of um, she checks with the FAA database and then she finds those aircraft that haven't been registered with us yet. And then she's contacting those aircraft owners to make sure that um, we're collecting all of the money we can. So um, she also has to sometimes coordinate with Department of Revenue um, for if it's um, been in collections for a little longer. And then she's also doing a lot of the office administration. So she's ordering the office supplies for the agency and then she's processing the mail. And so one of the great things about Jerry is she is very um, focused on processes. And so she's always kind of looking for, you know, ways to improve our processes to make everything a little more efficient. And then there's Lisa and Lisa is our agency accountant. So she's paying all those invoices. She is coordinating our agency credit cards. Um, she's looking for um, to make sure that we have the correct coding for all of our financial transactions. So that's really important because we want to make sure that everything is coming from the right pot of money. Um, and then if she sees any mistakes, she's doing the journal entries. So that's correcting those. And then she's also doing the accounts receivable. Um, she's maintaining our asset and our inventory lists and she's managing surplus. So the state has a surplus system where we can donate or we can sell some of our supplies that we're not using, and then we can also purchase them from other agencies there. So she coordinates all that for us. And then she also maintains the record um, retention that I was talking about earlier. So she'll have um, boxes of documents and keeps track of when they can be destroyed. And then she handles all of that for us. And then with Lisa, um, she does so much more than is on her position description or is listed here because she's always the one that's helping everybody out, you know, with their travel or their coding to make sure they're coding their invoices correctly, um, making sure they have their phone set up and all of those those extra things that that she does to make sure the agency runs smoothly. 
And then there's Holly, who you all know, um, who does the Aviation Board Administration. Um, and so there's so much work that goes into all of these meetings that she's doing behind the scenes to make sure that everything's running smoothly um, that you don't even see. So she's setting up everything way in advance, um, arranging for the locations, the meals, the lodging. Um, she also handles all the technology for the meetings. Um, so she recently um, ordered us some new speakers to make sure that everything sounds great. So she does a really good job of making sure that everything's running so smoothly and improving our process when she can. And then she also helps with the travel reimbursements and she, she does social media and marketing and maintaining the website. And so for that, um, that is actually something that hasn't been done for the agency for several years. And we've talked about that before um, because the the last position that had social media and marketing in it was all the way back in 2020. And so when Kenji came on, he one of his priorities was social media and outreach. And so we changed Holly's position a little bit and added that. And so she's really, you know, starting from zero with a lot of that stuff. And she's she does a great job, you know, with us changing what she has to do. She's, you know, learning new things, learning social media, and um, she does a great job with that. And that is, that's really all about my group. Do you have any questions? Oh, Catherine, you're on mute. Any questions for Kristen? Uh, Catherine, can I mention one thing? Yes. <laughs> uh, hey, Holly. What are our social media handles so everybody can actually uh, <laughs> like us and, and, and subscribe? It's <laughs> OR Aviation. So check us out on Instagram, OR Aviation, Facebook. Uh, we have Twitter. Twitter is for, more for like public notices of meetings. Um, but yeah, check us out. We got some staff photos up and we have uh, photos from conferences uh, on Instagram. Yeah. Don't and, forget and it, Yeah. And to everybody out there, if you have any cool pictures, send them to Holly and we'll make sure to get up um, up them ours the, the pictures up on social media. Uh as long as they're good. <laughs> 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 but but send them over to Holly because we'd love to showcase some of the stuff, the work that you're doing as well. Because it's not just about our our agency, but it's also all the airports and everything that's going on, the cool things that are going on. Like like Brian, cool stuff that's ha happening at your airport, or, or Catherine, cool stuff that's happening at your airport, or Steve, we'd love to show that off to everybody. And Sarah, if the, you live in such a beautiful area of the country anyways, just take a picture of outside your window and just send it to us and we'll post it. <laughs> Put my email in the chat. Go ahead, Jim. Oh, boy. Uh Kristen, I just want to say that it was really a very impressive presentation of so much work being accomplished with so few people. Uh, I'm amazed. Uh, that was a very thorough list. It gives me much better understanding of how your department works. I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Nice job. Thank you, Jim. All right. Any other questions for Kristen? And I would just echo what Jim says. I, I'm very impressed with the the amount of work with such a small team um, and quality as well. So Sarah, did you have something? I was just gonna say exactly the same. Um, I think that was great to be just that comprehensive overview of how many hats all of you wear in the agency and not just your department, but all of the departments. I think the more awareness you have on that, the better. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, and please extend your the kudos to your staff as well and support I will, them, definitely. them to hear that as well. So thank you. Okay, well then um, next for our work session agenda, we've got uh, our training on public work uh, records requests. Um, did anybody need a quick break before we head into that or are you all good just jumping right into it? Good to go? Okay, great. Well, then we have Andy Foltz uh, with the Oregon Department of Justice joining us today, who is going to walk us through our public records request training. Take it away. Well, good morning and thanks for uh, the invitation. Let me uh, share my presentation here. 
Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, the, the, the canned remarks are usually take about 50 minutes to get through. Um, we should leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end, um, but I would ask that we ask, uh, hold your questions until the end just so we can all stay on track. Chances are I'm probably gonna answer your question throughout the brief and we can all save some time at the end that way. Um, as, as was stated, my name is Andy Foltz. I'm with the Department of Justice. I am the Attorney General's Public Records Council, which basically means uh, that I adjudicate public records disputes between members of the public and state agencies if there's a dispute over records um, and access to those records. Uh, I also kind of oversee DOJ's processing of the public records requests that our own agency receives, and that's really kind of what the focus of this presentation is. It's really just a very high level wave top introduction to Oregon public records law. What the, you know, the takeaway should be that you generally know where to go find resources, who to ask for help, and understand what the general obligations of state agencies are with respect to public records. Here's a brief agenda. But before I get into the details of public records requests for what we call the inspection law, I want to kind of orient you to, to Oregon's transparency laws more generally, things like public records requests, but also public meetings law, records retention, um, and some of the policy making organizations that exist around that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Spend most of the time talking about public records requests and what the law says state agency obligations are and how to respond to requests. Talk, uh, spend a lot of time on public records exemptions, and those are statutory provisions that allow an agency to withhold information that would otherwise be subject to disclosure under the law. Talk brief, briefly about the public records appeal process. Like I said up front, that's that's kind of my day to day job is handling those appeals. And for some reason, the state archivist is still on the slide, but she will not be joining us today. I usually co present with her uh, on this, so you can disregard that. Okay. Just to kind of get you oriented to Oregon public transparency laws, everything um, relating to the transparency in Oregon is in ORS Chapter 192, and it covers a lot of areas. First portion of that law is the records archiving and disposition statutes. So that's records retention, record destruction um, types of, of rules. Those rules are all governed by the state archivist. So every agency is subject to state wide record retention rules and schedules, but most state agencies also have their own agency rules, which are approved by the archivist. I get a lot of questions about public records retention, and that's really not my specialty. And, I, and DOJ doesn't really have any authority outside of general legal advice on records retention matters. So if your agency has questions about whether particular records must be, sh should be, can be retained or destroyed, those questions are really best directed to the state archivist. The next section in chapter 192 is the records inspection or the public records request law, and that's what I'll be talking about today. But chapter 192 also covers the public records advocate. That was a fairly recently created position uh, about six years ago now, who ser serves as kind of a, a neutral ombudsman to help mediate disputes between public records requesters and agencies. There's also a section uh, in chapter 192 regarding public uh, protected health information. So you're all probably familiar with the term HIPAA, which is the federal privacy law that governs personal health information. Well, Oregon has its own version of HIPAA called mini HIPAA, and it provides against disclosure for certain protected information. So that's also in chapter 192. And then of course, public meetings law, This what we're participating in right now is a public meeting, and it is subject to the public meetings law. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about public meetings, but I will throw out there that if you're not aware, there have been substantial changes in the public meetings law over the last two years. Um, the biggest being that the Oregon Government Ethics Commission has given been given both primary enforcement authority over violation, alleged violations of the public meetings law, but they've also now been given authority to provide uh, advisory opinions and staff advice on any hypothetical scenario involving a public meetings issue. And so going forward, we're in the middle of, of rewriting um, the DOJ public records meetings and uh, public records and meetings manual. And the most of that rewrite involves this public meetings 
these changes in the public meetings law and, and the fact that going forward, uh, as you're reaching out to contact counsel like Stacy with, with public meetings questions, you might be referred to the ethics commission for that advice because they actually have statutory authority to provide that advice. And that advice provides members of the public body with certain safe harbor protections against civil, viol uh, civil liability if there are any violations of the public meetings law. So stand by for more rules and guidance on public meetings. Okay, let's talk about public records requests. Right up front, I just want to say that um, public records, for those who are involved with public records requests, it can be a very tedious and very thankless job. Um, the, the, ru the rules are fairly clear, um, but the interpretation the applications of the rule can be very frustrating. So for those folks in your staff who are involved with public records requests, it's really important that they know what those rules are. And so there are training, there's training available like what I'm providing right now. There's some other stuff that we we have available online. And at the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll put um, I have a slide with all, all kinds of resources available to those who need to know what the rules are. And I'm going to cover kind of the basic rules in today's presentation. The next key to success is communication. Most most disputes, whether it's an appeal to the attorney general or in subsequent litigation, most of those disputes are really a breakdown in communication or a failure to communicate up front. And by communication, I, I mean not only between the agency and the public records requester, but within the agency. Because oftentimes your public records coordinator is not actually the custodian of the records. They're going to have to find someone within the agency who knows where these records are, have them locate, review them for exempt material and all that. And it, that, that's not work that anyone wants to do. It's not particularly enjoyable, but there are statutory obligations to do that within certain timeframes and failure to do so then enables a public records requester to file an appeal or ultimately wind up in litigation. So a lot of that can be um, avoided by just communicating up front. Like if, you're, if you're, your public records front person is struggling to communicate internally, they can talk to the requester and just say, hey, the staff who, who normally who needs to identify where these records are and review them is currently unavailable. And so we think it's gonna be a couple of weeks uh, before we're going to get back to you, even with an estimated completion date. As long as you have that kind of open communication with the requester, you can you can avoid most conflicts. Uh, same thing. I mean, that leads right into managing expectations. Manage expectations within the staff. So if you have been asked by your agency's public records coordinator to work on a public records request, make sure that they understand and have a good expectation of what you are able to deliver and when so that they can then turn uh, and communicate that to the public records requester. And as long as expectations are the same, um, then no one will be disappointed and the communication should flow. A challenge uh, for a lot of agencies, I know you're relatively small, but I don't know how you keep your records, but I know within DA DOJ, it's, it's, it's a real challenge to even know where records are. There are about 40 different electronic records keeping systems alone notwithstanding individual cell phones and computer lap uh, hard drives and, and such. So even locating and knowing where stuff is um, stored and then how to even search for it is a big challenge. So the folks who are managing your public records um, request process really need to understand where records are likely to be located and how you search for them. And then finally, uh, as part of communicating and managing the expectations is making sure everyone appreciates what the priority is that public records requests must receive. Uh, both the attorney general and the courts have stated or noted that responding to public records requests is a statutory responsibility, and that responsibility must take priority over any non-statutory responsibilities or functions that the agency may be choosing to perform. And if, if we were to get an appeal where in a, a particular agency was taking way too long to respond, and it turns out they were doing it because of they were pursuing non-statutory priorities of the agencies. That's a scenario in which the AG may grant a petition and order the agency to reorder its priorities. Okay, so what is the basic rule for public records? The basic rule is that every person has a right to inspect any public record of a public body in this state. Each one of those underlying terms is defined by statute. All you need to know is for in terms of who is a person, a person is basically any any entity other than an other, an, another public body. 
So it can be a company, a corporation, an individual, a special interest group, members of the media. It's a very, very broad definition, but it does not include other public bodies. So if you receive a public records request, let's say from the FAA, that's not a proper public records request. You can choose whether to respond to that or not, but that kind of request does not trigger all of the rights and responsibilities under public records law because it's not coming from a person as that term is defined. A public record, I've got a sep separate uh, slide on what the definition of a public record is, and then of a public body, all you need to know is that the Department of Ag Aviation and the State Board are both public bodies for purposes of the public records law. So that's the basic rule. It's like every public record that every public body has is subject to inspection by any person, very broad. Uh, but of course, there are lots of exceptions to that. We call those exemptions, and I will spend quite a bit of time later in the brief talking about the exemptions. So to make sure everyone's listening and paying attention and interested in this, I've got a few kind of quizzes sprinkled throughout. I'm not polling answers. I'm just going to read it to you and let you think about it. And uh, I, will, uh, I will answer it for you. <laughs> the first one is true or false. The definition of a public record for purposes of public records retention and destruction is the same as for purposes of the public records request. So as I mentioned before, Chapter 192 has a section that talks about public records retention and destruction, and then a separate section for public records and inspection. And so the question is, is the definition of a public record under those two sections the same? Are we talking about the same universe of, universe of records that are subject to retention and destruction as for purposes of public records request? The answer is no, unfortunately and confusingly. Um, I'll let you read this. This is the definition of a public record for purposes of the public records inspection law. The key terms here are it's any writing that relates in any way to the agency's business as prepared, owned, used, or retained, regardless of physical form or characteristics. So it says any writing, but then it says regardless of physical form or characteristics. Well, if you look at the definition of writing in the law, it's it's basically any form of recorded information. So it's digital information, it's text messages, it's handwritten notes, memos, emails, you name it, voicemails, drafts of policies or reports. Um, if it's recorded information and it relates to the business of the agency and it is owned, used, or retained by the agency, then it's a public record subject to inspection. And so if at the time of a public records request, you have something that meets the description and meets the definition of a public record, it is subject to disclosure unless one of the exemption applies. In contrast, the, public rec the definition of a public record for retention purposes is much narrower. Um, it, 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 it uses the term necessary. So retaining that information is actually necessary to satisfy the agency's fiscal, legal, or administrative requirements. And that's all kind of mashed out through the development of retention schedules, both the state level, statewide retention schedules and agency specific retention schedules. So what you will find is that what you're actually required to keep should generally be much smaller, a smaller body of records than what would be subject to a public records request. Well, why does that matter to you? It matters to you because hygiene is important. If you don't need to keep a record, don't keep it. Because if you do keep it and it's that it exists at the time of a public records request, then it is subject to disclosure. So hygiene, keeping keeping up on your the rules governing what you need to retain when it needs to be destroyed, seeking uh, waivers from the archivist if necessary to destroy stuff earlier. Um, can be really important. It also just makes it makes your agency function more efficiently if you don't have to deal with more yeah. records than necessary. Okay, so this is really going to be more geared towards your public records staff, who we heard heard a little bit about today already. But um, I'm going to spend a couple of uh, the next section of the briefing kind of talking about the circle of life of a public records request and what's required because this is really where. If you trip up on any of these things, that's what's going to trigger the requester's right to file an appeal with the attorney general or, or ultimately wind up in, in litigation. So it all starts at the top with agency policy. The, the law requires that every agency adopt and publish their policy 
on how public records requests will be handled by the agency. So it's everything from how do you how do I submit a request? Um, you know, is is there a fax option, an email option, a a um, online portal, whatever? It has there has to be a policy. It has to be published. So here is your po policy. Um, I had to go digging in in the rule uh, rules to find it because it wasn't actually pu pu published on your website. But you do have a published policy, so it satisfies the, the requirements of the law, um, and it talks about what the basic requirements are um, and how you file it. And particularly, I know this is small, but you know it it provides a link to your website, and on your website is another link to, to submit a, a public records request online. Importantly, and I'm going to talk a little bit about fees later, but it also importantly notes that the Department of Aviation has adopted the DAS statewide policy on fees. That's important, and I'll explain why later. Um, so yeah, so you have to have a policy. Why that's important is because if a requester does not submit a request in accordance with the agency policy, then it is not a proper request, and all of the rights and responsibilities of the public records law technically do not attach. So you know, there's some burden on the public to get it right, too. And this is just a snapshot of what your online public records request form looks like, in case you're curious. OK, the next important thing is whether or not it's a proper request. As I mentioned, to be proper, number one, it must comply with the agency's published policy. Number two, it has to be in writing. Um, telephonic requests, in-person requests are technically not proper public records requests, and so you're not obligated to process them. Um, the, to be a proper request, it also has to be sent to or received by the person designated by your agency policy as having authority to receive a request. And, and I'll just give you a scenario that we deal with regularly in DOJ. You know, we have a whole trial division that represents state agency in litigation, and it is not uncommon during litigation for opposing counsel to make discovery requests, investigative demands, all that kind of stuff, and they'll bury a public records request in there. And they'll give it to their the, their uh, DOJ trial counsel, and DOJ trial counsel sees it. Well, DOJ trial counsel is not authorized under DOJ policy to receive public records requests, so those are technically not proper public records requests. But believe it or not, someone has actually sued us in the past for failing to respond to a public records request that was buried in a discovery request in litigation. So what we do, as a matter of course, is if anyone within DOJ is asked to disclose public records, we we don't. We don't play the game of just ignoring it, even though technically we can. We, we try to honor the request and make sure that we either notify the person how to file a proper request or that DOJ employee will forward that request to either my, myself or paralegal who, who handles our public records request program. The next uh, important thing is to understand whether or not your agency is even the proper custodian the term custodian under the public records law is defined, and but it's, it's basically whether your agency actually has some kind of legal or uh, business purpose for creating, maintaining, or using that information. And it is almost always the case that there are multiple agencies that are the custodian for the same information. Um, but sometimes it can be real confusing as to whether or not your agency is even a, a custodian of what's been requested. And and so that's you know something you might want to add. If you have that question, you know, something you can reach out to, to Stacy about. OK, the next one uh, area is processing time frame. So if you've got the proper request submitted in accordance with agency policy, then the ball is rolling and all of the uh, obligations of the rights and responsibilities of public records will attach. And the first one is understanding what your processing time frames are. So I've got another quiz here. When must an agency complete its response to a public records request? within 10 days, within 15 business days, as soon as practical without unreasonable delay, or within 15 business days of receipt of payment of any processing fees? The answer is C, as soon as practicable and without unreasonable delay. So those of you who are, have some familiarity with the public records law may know that a couple of years ago there was uh, an amendment to the law that added a 15 business day rule. And so you're probably asking yourself, I thought we had a 15 new 15 business day rule. Um, and then we had to respond within 15 business day. No, that's not the rule. The rule 
is and always has been since the 70s that an agency must respond to a public records request as soon as practical without unreasonable delay. However, this is the new 15 business day rule. If a public agency cannot complete its response within 15 business days, it has to provide an estimated completion date to the requester. That's it. So if you can complete your request uh, response within 15 business days, great. If you can't, you just need to provide an estimated completion date. And it has to be an estimated date. It can't just be, uh, it might be two or three months or whatever. And technically, the, the statute says it has to be an estimated completion date, but it doesn't have to be accurate and you can always update it. Like, you just take your best guess based on agency resources, the size of the request, whether or not it, the records that have been requested are going to require extensive redactions, all kinds of things go into how long it will take to respond. And so if it's one of those, it's going to be kind of a gnarly, time-consuming request and you have limited resources to do it, that estimated completion date may be several months out. That's not uncommon. And as long as you provide that estimated completion date within 15 business days, you have satisfied that requirement. The problem is a lot of agencies still don't quite understand how this rule works and they fail to provide an estimated completion date within 15 business days and that is automatically appealable to the attorney general for state agencies and it is probably the most common appeal that, that we receive um, so it's important to understand how that that rule works it's a really easy rule to, to comply with I think a lot of people just don't understand how it works. Like it, it really shouldn't take 15 business days to come up with an estimated completion date if you know you can't respond soon. <clears throat> okay, next, um, talking a little bit about public records request processing fees. Agencies are permitted under the law to recover their actual costs of processing the request. So that's everything from the manpower uh, associated with it to the time spent reproducing records, reviewing them for redactions, and there are some exceptions to that, but um, agencies can and do regularly uh, try to recoup the fees of processing public records requests. So I've got another question here for you. So state agencies must waive or reduce the processing fees if disclosure will primarily benefit the general public. True or false? So if disclosure will primarily benefit the general public, the agency has to waive its fees. That is a false statement. As I said, agencies are permitted to recover actual costs. There are provisions that allow agencies the discretion to waive or reduce fees if the public interest requires disclosure in a particular instance, but it is discretionary. Um, there, there's been a lot of push in the last couple legislative sessions to take that discretion away <clears throat> and mandate that agencies waive or reduce fees if public interest if, if disclosure will primarily benefit the general public but right now it's still discretionary if if an agency determines that disclosure will primarily benefit the general public but nevertheless denies the request for fee waivers or reductions as a matter of agency discretion that is something that's appealable to the attorney general and as mentioned early, earlier, there is a DAS statewide policy on public records requests, fees, and charges, and your department has adopted that as its fee schedule. And what it does is it, it number one, it sets minimum, or it sets maximum hourly charges for certain categories of labor. So there's 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 clerical, there's managerial, there's legal, uh, different different hourly rates for all those sorts of things. But it also provides worksheets to help determine and evaluate requests for waivers and reductions in terms of whether or not um, certain criteria are met so that the agency can make an informed decision. Because at the end of the day, if an agency does deny a, a request and we get an appeal, we're just going to review whether or not the agency made a reasonable decision, not an arbitrary one. It has to, they have to uh, show that it was a reasonable denial. <clears throat> okay, the next big area is exemptions um, as I mentioned the, the general rule provides that any member of the public may get access to any public record of a public body except and there are a lot of exceptions we call those exemptions so my next question for you is how many exemptions do you think Oregon has less than 100 between 100 and 300 between 300 and 500 or more than 500 The answer is D, more than 500. 
Um, I keep the catalog of, of exemptions for the state as we become aware of new statutes um, that, that do provide confidentiality over certain public records. And at last count, we're over 650 public records exemptions just in Oregon. And we also incorporate certain federal uh, exemptions as well. So there are lots of exceptions to the, the general rule. When we're talking about exemptions, we kind of characterize them into three different bubbles. Um, I don't know if you'll find this particularly helpful or not, so I'm going to go through it really quickly. But if you do want to drill down into it, this would be a, a good place for Q&A. Um, but we, we, we rec first, we recognize what are called conditional exemptions. All conditional exemptions, and there are about 45 of them, exist in Chapter 192.345, and they are conditional in that they permit, each one of those exemptions permits a, a public body to withhold certain information unless the public interest requires disclosure. So every one of those exemptions is conditioned upon a balancing of the public interest. And if the public interest requires disclosure, the agency must disclose. The other nice thing about, or uh, often overlooked thing, I guess, about conditional exemptions is every conditional exemption is discretionary. So a lot of agencies think, well, I've got this exemption. It allows me to withhold this information. I must withhold it. That's actually not how most exemptions work. I've, probably 90% of the public records exemption in Oregon are discretionary, meaning that an agency can withhold, but it's not required to withhold. Like disclosure is not prohibited. There are certainly uh, statutes that prohibit disclosure, but the vast majority of them are discretionary. And so sometimes an agency will be like, oh, we've got this crazy large public records request, and we're going to have to go through and redact everyone's private email addresses because that's exempt under the public records law. And it's going to take us hundreds of hours. And my, my answer to that is, well, why would you do that? You can redact people's private email addresses, but you're not required to. And if that's what's going to drive up the time and the cost, just give, give them up. Like, what, what, what are you trying to protect there? It's a discretionary exemption. That is not something we in DOJ would waste time or money on to, to, um, protect that, that kind of stuff. So everything in the conditional exemptions bubble is discretionary. And here are some examples. And this, some of these might surprise you because you would think that disclosure might be prohibited. So examples down in the bottom right, um, you know, information pertaining to ongoing or anticipated litigation is conditionally exempt. So even litigation material, if the public interest requires disclosure during active lit litigation, that information must be disclosed. Same thing for trade secrets. Same thing for information gathered or compiled during a criminal investigation, records relating to employee disciplinary actions. Um, those are all conditional exemptions. The next bubble is the unconditional exemptions. The only difference here is there's no public interest balancing test. It, the information is just exempt. Um, there, there are lots of different variations to unconditional exemptions, but the big distinction is that there is no public interest balancing test. That doesn't mean that, is, that withholding the information is required. As I said, even the majority of the unconditional exemptions are discretionary. And in the email example I gave you is an example of an unconditional exemption. So personal email addresses that appear in a state body's records are exempt from public disclosure, regardless of the public interest in those email addresses. But the agency still has discretion to disclose it. Like disclosure of email addresses is not um, prohibited. And then the final uh, group, and this is the vast majority of, of the 650 exemptions, this is probably 400 of them, are what we call specially conditioned. And they're just kind of all over the map um, because they some of them incorporate some modified version of the public interest balancing test some of them have a burden shifting or a different evidentiary standard so the general rule is that an agency always has the burden to sustain its actions so if an agency asserts a public records exemption and they get an appeal they have the burden of, of uh, you know establishing that uh, an exemption applied if it's a conditional exemption that the public interest didn't require disclosure um, those sorts of things. But under the specially conditioned exemptions, some of them actually shift the burden to the requester. And one of the most common examples is um, what we would call information, the disclosure of which would be an unreasonable invasion of personal privacy, the personal privacy exemption. In that particular case, it's an unconditional exemption because 
it puts the burden on the requester to show that disclosure would not be an unreasonable invasion of privacy. So that's just an example. So your, your public record staff should be generally familiar with what kind of exemptions your agency applies and you know, which one of these fall into which one of these buckets and how they, how they uh, play out. And if they, of course, if they have any questions about it, they can reach out to, to Stacy. So still in the area of kind of exemptions. So when an agency is allowed to permit, uh, permitted to withhold a record, this next question is true or false. If, if the record is exempt and they're allowed to, to withhold it, they are allowed to withhold it forever. Like it's permanently exempt, true or false. Answer is false for almost every single exemption. There are a couple of exceptions that probably would never apply to your department's records. Um, but there is a, a caveat in the public records law that says every, notwithstanding every exemption in the public Oregon public records law, once a record is more than 25 years old, it's available for inspection. And no one really thought about this rule for until very recently. And it's for a couple of reasons. First of all, public records law didn't even become 25 years old until last decade. Um, most record, most agencies don't really even keep records that long, so it's not an issue for them. But there are some categories of records that are maintained for more than 25 years that contain all kinds of information, like think medical information, um, think tax information um, that, you know, we would ordinarily want not want to make publicly available. Um, but unless it falls into one of those very narrow exceptions, for example, if it's if it's health information relating to someone who's still alive, that's one of the few exceptions. But if it's health information relating to someone that's dead, um, it's now available for inspection. So my question for agencies that have records like this that they're worried about having to disclose after 25 years is, why are you keeping it that long? Like, get rid of it. If you don't need it, if you don't have a business purpose for it now, get rid of it. Um, Okay, so we've talked about the exempt material. Now we're coming home. We're talking about completing the response. And so once we've been through all of this, you've got policy, you've got a proper request, you're the custodian, you're complying with your processing timeframes, you've worked through the fees, you're processing it, you've found all the exempt material. How do you complete the response and why is that important? Well, completing the response is actually something that is now defined by statute. Until uh, about five years ago, there was no definition for what it meant to complete this response. And so sometimes it was ambiguous as to whether or not an agency had even completed its response. And why it's important is that all of the, none of the appeal rights get triggered until an agency has completed its response. So here's what it means to complete the response. And this is all defined by statute. First, you have to disclose all non-exempt records. So kind of buried in that nugget is a principle of public records law that there is a duty to separate exempt from non-exempt material. And so if you have a record, and I'll use an attorney-client privilege communication. So let's say you have a communication with Stacy, and it's a long thread. Let's say it's like 12 different email threads all built on each other. And it begins with a request to DOJ for legal advice. That is something we would ordinarily consider privileged. And then attached to that is Stacy's advice. We would consider that privilege. But then that thread kind of takes on a life of its own and people chime in with other non-legal stuff. And so the question is, can you withhold that entire thread? It's one document and you know, it exists in Outlook as a single email, even though it's really a long thread. So the question is, since there's some privilege at the bottom of that, can you withhold the entire thread? And the answer is no. You have to separate out the, the exempt information and disclose the non-exempt part. And so that's, that's uh, you know, normally done through redacting. If you are withholding any information, whether you're withholding an entire record or redacting information for a record, agencies now have to identify the specific statutory exemption that they're relying on to withhold that information. Now, you don't have to do, you might have seen like, this is common with federal agencies under FOIA, where every single little blacked out piece has a statute assigned to it to, to describe what the basis for withholding that information was. That's not required in Oregon law. You can give them a bunch of marked up records and then the cover email accompanying it. Just say, we have withheld information 
exempt from disclosure under the public records law under these provisions, and then you, you just cite a laundry list. Of course, the requester may come back and say, well, you know, what, what was privileged or what was submitted in confidence or what's a trade secret? You know, if you have the time and the resources and, and you want to have good relations with the public, you know, it's you can answer those questions, but you're not technically obligated to. But if it's someone that you're dealing with a lot, or particularly the media, um, I know we in DOJ try to satisfy all those kinds of questions because to us, that's part of effective communications and maintaining relationships, particularly with folks that we deal with often. So I already mentioned the segregating non-exempt material and disclosing that. And then finally, um, notif the, the law now requires that you notify the requester of their appeal rights. That's a relatively new pr provision. And as a result of that, now that everyone gets notified of their appeal rights, the number of appeals we've gotten over the last five years is quadrupled. Um, and that's not a bad thing, um, but, and I don't, I can't recall, and maybe Stacy can remind me at the end of the presentation, whether we've even had any appeals involving aviation or not, you don't, your agency doesn't stand out as problematic at all. So <laughs> I think that's good, good news. I think unfortunately the answer might be not yet. Not yet. I know, I know we've been working some issues, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so that's it. That's the wheel of life of a public records request. Um, kind of the high level. Uh, I've got a couple slides here now just that are miscellaneous stuff. I've talked a lot about appeals and enforcement because that's what I do. So what so what happens if you get all this wrong or someone thinks you got it all wrong? Under the public records law, if, if it involves a request for state agency records, the general rule is that someone can file an appeal with the attorney general and they must file an appeal with the attorney general before they can go to court. They can always go to court eventually to, to uh, seek enforcement of the public records law. So what can be appealed? Obviously, if an if agency withholds records, so they've denied the request in whole or in part, that's appealable. We talked about the 15 business day deadline and the duty to provide records as soon as practical without unreasonable delay. So failure to do that is appealable to include just failing to provide that estimated completion date. That triggers the, the uh, right to appeal. And not only that, if an agency fails to provide an estimated completion date, that's appealable. And by, by law, the attorney general's required to treat that failure as a denial of the request, um, which automatically kind of creates a presumption that, that the AG uh, will be granting the petition and ordering the agency to disclose within a certain time that may or may not be convenient for the agency. So it's important to understand how that rule works. Um, as I said, if, if you provide a, a requester with an estimated completion date, they can appeal that estimate if they think it's unreasonable or unlike, uh, likely to result in undue, undue delay. Um, we don't get many of those kinds of appeals because most of the time the, the dates are not that far out, but we've seen records, um, estimated completion dates of three, four, five months um, for particularly large requests and gotten appeals related to those and then we work with the agency to better understand how the records are stored located reviewed what the resources are for um, you know the manpower resources are resources are to actually process and kind of distill it down to how many hours a week can the agency commit to that request and what does that translate into in terms of weeks months um but just know that that is appealable same thing for denials of a fee waiver reduction. As I mentioned, if, if a requester believes an agency has unreasonably denied their request for a fee waiver denial, that is appealable. And that, that decision is reviewed for on a reasonableness standard, kind of an abuse of discretion standard. And then there's a catch-all. Uh, this is fairly new in the law as well. So any other failure to comply with 192.329. 192.329 is the statute that provides the 15 business day rule. It provides some other, it, it also requires, it, it also is a statute that defines what it means to complete a response. Um, there's a lot in there. We don't get a lot of appeals under that provision specifically, but just know that the, the kind of aperture for what can be appealed is much broader now than it was five years ago. <clears throat> So here's the appeal process, depending on who the requester is and um, what agency is, is the subject of the request. 
All you really need to know is that your agency falls along the top, the blue state agency, non-elected officials. So if, if the requester wants to file a denial or, or file an appeal related to the Department of Aviation, they would have to file that appeal with the attorney general first. If they do not get full relief from the attorney general, then they can go to court. That's all you really need to know. But they must go through the attorney general first before they can go to court. So what happens if the attorney general grants the petition, either in whole or in part? The order uh, to the department will instruct the department of what its options are. So the department can choose not to comply with the order, but if they do that, they must notify DOJ within seven days of its intent not to comply, and the agency must initiate a civil lawsuit against the public records requester shortly thereafter. So basically, if, if, if your department was ordered to do something on an appeal of a public records request and you didn't want to do that, that means you're prepared to go to court and sue the requester. Um, that has not happened. Actually, that's not true. We've had it happen twice in the last five years, both involving um, the Oregon Medical Board. It's, it's no secret. You, uh, there's been some reporting about it, uh, about particular practitioner misconduct investigations um, and whether or not certain records related to those investigations and licensing actions should be subject to public uh, records disclosure. Um, the AG granted a couple of petitions in part and the board elected uh, to go to court and try and get an inju injunction against those disclosures. And one of those cases is still pending. One of those cases was actually uh, decided in favor of the medical board a couple of years ago. So these aren't hypothetical scenarios. There's lots of public records litigation in the courts. Uh, DOJ at any given time is defending state agencies. That, you know, we, we've got three to five cases at any given time where we're defending a state agency in court um, on a public records matter. Final quiz. So if you've gotten an appeal and the attorney general determines that an agency has failed to respond to a request within the applicable time frames. She may a order the disclosure of records within seven days. B order the agency to pay a two hundred dollar penalty to the public records requester. C order the agency to waive or reduce its fees. D all of the B, all of the above or E just A and C, which is the order disclosure and order them to waive fees. The answer is all of the above. Um, if if an, the AG has concluded that an agency failed to provide a timely response, um, she can order any of these remedies, order disclosure within seven days or any other period deemed necessary to bring the, the agency back into compliance with the law, can order the agency to pay a penalty to the requester and to waive, reduce, or refund any fees paid back to the public records requester. So understand that there are some teeth to the law now. These are fairly new provisions. They're only about five years old. Um, yeah. Okay, here are some uh, resources for you if you have questions about the public records law generally or about specific exemptions. So obviously your DOJ contact counsel is your first line of defense. Um, reach out to Stacy if you have questions. I also serve as a re kind of a backstop resource for the DOJ counsel. So if your DOJ attorney can't figure it out, they'll usually contact me for, for advice. Um, the AG public records and meetings manual. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's available electronically down, downloadable off of the, the DOJ website. Um, it's a great resource. Version is 2019 and we are on track to publish a new version by the end of 2024. So that that should be available in January. I mentioned earlier the Public Records Advocate. That's a new organization uh, or a couple of individuals uh, who help mediate public records disputes. So if you are dealing with a particular issue, you can also reach out directly to the public. Your agency can reach out directly to the Public Records Advocate for advice. They're not it's not like privileged legal advice, but it's kind of common sense. You know, how, how should I work with this requester kind of thing? Or you may get drug into mediation um, at the request of the public records advocate. 
Next is the DOJ public records exemption list. This is also available on DOJ's website, and it's a really good tool because I mentioned there are over 650 exemptions. They're all in there. And if you go to that website, there will be a little search box. And if you want to know every single exemption that apply, that's applies specifically to Department of Aviation, you just type aviation in, in that box and every exemption will come up. Not only will it come up, it'll provide a link to the text of the exemption statute, and then it will provide you links to every Court of Appeals, Supreme Court, or AG opinion that has ever evaluated that exemption. So it's all right there. So if you want to look at trade secrets, you just type trade secret, every statute that has trade secrets implications and it will come up for you and so on. So it's a real quick way to figure out if an exemption might apply to, to uh, records that have been requested from your agency. The AG's public records orders, um, so that's, you know, I, I draft those for the AG. They're all available online at the State of Oregon Law Library website. That's the same web page you would go to to get all the Supreme Court opinions, Court of Appeals opinions and such. All of those orders are there as well. And they kind of serve as um, persuasive authority for, for state agencies as well as uh, non-state agencies you know, below the, the state level. And then finally, uh, the VAS statewide policy on fees. I already skewed uh, you to that particular policy and what it does and doesn't do. You know, I mentioned the, uh, the persuasive authority of the public records orders. I'm going to go back to the slide on enforcement because I think you've got some se several folks in the meeting who actually um, work for employees of maybe local or sub-state agency level. Um, so I just want to make sure that you understand that if there's a, a dispute involving a request for, let's say, a municipal uh, body's public records, that appeal would go to the district attorney. So whereas a state agency dispute would go to the attorney general, all of those the disputes involving anything other than a state agency go down to the, the district attorney's office for resolution, and they issue orders similar to those that the AG issues. And again, it's required that they go through the DA before they can sue. The only exception to all that is if, if the records involve an agency that is led by an elected official or the records requested are in the custody of an elected official, then um, there is no administrative appeal to either the attorney general or the district attorney, but in those cases, the requester has to go straight to court. Okay, and that concludes my presentation. Um, let me unshare here. I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, very good. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that presentation. Are there questions? And I'm, I guess I have a question for you. And I'm just curious, how how often are there um, challenges to public records requests? Um, well, it's 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 a moving target. Um, <laughs> I've been in this job six and a half years. When I started, we handled about forty appeals a year. Last year, we did one hundred and seventy-two, mm. and it's wow. and it's going up. <laughs> <laughs> like I mentioned, and I think that's largely a function of this new requirement that agencies also have to notify the uh, requester what their appeal rights are. And some agencies were actually inserting a link to our appeal page. So all they had to do is press, you know, click this link and say, I, I protest this decision. <laughs> it's like all of a sudden. So, I, you know, I'm not is discouraging the agencies from doing that. But, you know, when you do that, yeah. you're going to get a lot more appeals. Um, is, is there, there a, a theme, theme to it? Um, is there a certain type untimely of? Untimely responses. Untimely okay, responses. Okay, yeah. Um, and like I said, your agency is not, doesn't, I, I have nothing but good impressions of your agency. There are a couple agencies that, that struggle, um, partly because of turnover and public records staff. You know, it's it's a, like I said, it's a kind of a thankless job and uh, it's hard to keep good people um, interested in it and and especially if management doesn't back them up like if management doesn't appreciate the priorities that must be given to public records requests and doesn't resource the staff to respond appropriately um those are some of the messiest appeals and those are the ones most likely to be granted as well and sometimes agencies you know it's for them it is a resource constraint and this is an unfunded mandate and so sometimes agencies will use these adverse outcomes as support for their, you know, getting additional money authorized to hire positions to work this kind of stuff. 
Um, but that is that's the biggest trend. Un, either an agency didn't respond at all to requests or or failed to meet the 15 business day deadline. Those are certainly the most common. There are categories of records that are just so clearly exempt that people just don't understand it. So we like the most common appeal we get involves child protective service records. And you know, they're just exempt. But lots of people request them, you know, victims, families, subjects of investigations, everybody wants to know what's going on. And so we get so those are not hard appeals, but we get a lot of them. I can't think of any exemptions that are specific to Department of Aviation, other than I know a couple of years ago they enacted something about RPA proprietary information for RPA test ranges or something like that. So that's probably particular to, to your agency um, and some local agencies, but it's really a trade secret exemption. It's, it really doesn't do any more than what the trade secret exemption already did, but it's there. So you guys, I, I can't think of anything that would be particular to your agency that would be unique. So yeah, anybody else? Okay, great. Yes, right, Jim. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, how often has the Attorney General imposed a $200 penalty? Is that never? Never. Okay. I suspected. Um, we have, uh, on a handful of occasions, ordered a reduction of fees, a couple of refunds of fees. The, the standard for imposing a $200 penalty is a little bit higher. The, the statute has some particular requirements, but th there has to be at least at least some indications of bad faith and heel dragging by the agencies for that to really kick in. Sure. And um, plus, it's you know, for some big agencies, it's not even really much of a sanction. You know, they don't want to be the first, but what's two hundred bucks? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is a moral victory, and it's usually the same people. Like it always gets to the point where you've got one requester who's made, and I get this question about a lot about the, the vexatious requester, like this someone who's just wasting resources. They never pay the fee estimates. They keep coming back with these overly broad. And they're hostile, like their tone is hostile. Um, they're just difficult people to work with. And every agency has has these folks. And just, you know, be, uh, my advice is always keep it professional. Yes, you have to respond to every request. You don't get to like that after the 20th request, you can't just start ignoring them. But those are the ones that typically devolve into something like, and now I want them to refund my fees and I want a $200 penalty. And I want a $200 penalty for the last 10 requests I made too, and blah, blah, blah. And, um, yeah, the, it just, we haven't hit that point yet. Um, and usually, you know, I, a lot of what I do in my job is to kind of mediate away a lot of these disputes, like it comes back to that communication and, and managing expectations. And if I can get the parties talking during an appeal, um, probably 40% of the time we wind up moving out the petition because we can get them talking, we can get create different expectations and we cannot waste the AG's time with all this. And then, you know, we've had really good success with that. So I view that as my, one of my, um, one of my roles, my measures of success is how many of these can I like, particularly when the parties can have a continuing relationship, like between the media, like between the media and the police, the media and the department of corrections, it's like no one wins if they have an enduring and contentious relationship over these public records requests. So, um, so sometimes like the media will just copy me on their public records request to a particular agency that they've had problems with in the past, just as leverage to make sure that the agency is paying attention and they're not going to drop the ball on it. Not that I put my thumb on the scale of the agency. I mean, the agency is our client, but they, they feel comfort with that. Same thing. Agencies will copy me on their correspondence back to a requester that they know is likely to file an appeal that they've had problems with in the past. So, um, Again, that's kind of advanced appellate public records disputes, but not not something I think your agency has had any recent experience with. Any other questions? Kenji. Kenji. Andy. Yeah. So I, I do have two questions. So here's a question for you: If they fail, if you have a vexatious uh, person who keeps on doing it and they fail to pay, fail to pay their fees, is that a situation? You, we can just send them to collections. <laughs> <laughs> well, you shouldn't be doing the work if you haven't collected the fee. So the way the fee 
authorities work uh -huh. is you cannot charge or seek to collect a fee greater than $25 unless the requester has consented. And if a, if a requester has agreed to pay the fees, we an agency could start working on it, but we normally recommend that the check clear before you start working on it. Okay. Because occasionally okay. checks do bounce or the checks never come. So um, you shouldn't have anything to collect if you're following okay. that rule. Um, okay. And and those all those processing times I talked about, those are all told while you're either requesting clarification from a requester or waiting for payment on a fee. Um, all those obligations are kind of suspended during that time frame as well. And if you don't get clarification or payment within 60 days, uh, the, the agency is actually required to close the request. And that's important that you actually do close the request because as soon as it's closed, all the, their ability to appeal and everything kind of goes away. So like if we were to get an appeal on day 90 on something that was closed, we, we would probably say we don't even have jurisdiction anymore because this is not an active request. They were statutorily required to close it at 60 days for non-payment. And so we no longer, we don't have jurisdiction over it. Okay. And the, the, the other question I had was if, if somebody has, wants a public record, they don't necessarily have records request uh, sort of system, right? They can just ask us for it. And if we're, Hey, here you go. We have no, we have no, yep. no issue with it. That that might be a good way to to address it, correct? And that none of do though. If we do that, do we sort of implicate any uh, sort of obligations under the statutory language, or is it just pretty much just like? Well, so there's no obligation on the public records law to track or log all of your requests and how they were processed and you know when they came in when they were answered there's no requirement to do all of that a lot of agencies do and, and it's a good business practice um and in conjunction with that that all of your correspondence be in writing okay you know it, only only in case there's any ambiguity as to what was given and to whom when because it, so here's the scenario um doj's public information officer gets a request from the media for some document and it's not exempt so our PIO gives the document out public record staff doesn't know about that a competing media outlet finds out that this outlet got that document from DOJ and then we get a formal public records request from that competitor saying I want a copy of what DOJ disclosed to so and so and I'm like I don't know what you're talking about we didn't get a response a public records request from so it's just about internal communication. So we we have a process to avoid that from happening, but that kind of thing used to happen. It doesn't happen anymore. But so same kind of thing. If, if a member of the staff just happened to give a record to somebody else, just know that that is now public. They can do whatever they want to with it. And other people may be requesting it as well. So make sure your public record staff knows that and where to get it so that they can respond quickly. Perfect. Thank you. Any other right. questions? Any other questions? Okay, I don't see right. any. Just making sure I'm not missing any. So thank you so much, Andy, for that presentation today. Very informative. So thanks thank for you. helping to keep us all out of trouble. <laughs> all right. Well, you know where to find us. <laughs> there are more questions. Thank you, Andy. Yep. Thank it. you. Thank I'm you, Stacy. Okay, and then um, Stacy, did you have? I, I couldn't tell you with you were raising your hand or not. I was saying goodbye. I, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. All right. Great. Well, I think that is all of our agenda for today. So, unless you have anything else, Kenji. Nope. Then, uh, just Steve and uh, Catherine. You, you should have a link. So. Yeah, the other link. Yep. Okay. Yep. Very good. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we will adjourn this work session. All right. Thanks, all. Catherine, Great to see everybody. You. Bye. 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 This meeting is uh, recording is, is going to be ending.